Right, hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. It is spooky season. And if you didn't realise it was spooky season, clearly, can you not tell by my decor? I literally was in Aldi the other day and I saw these hanging garlands, these spooky garlands. And I thought, well, they're made out of cardboard, they're reusable every year, I can put them away and I can bring them out every year. So I've, put, I've attempted to put it up and create something a little bit spooky. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see them against the backdrop of the books, which is why I've then added the fairy lights to try and give it a little bit of ambiance. I also have a tiny pumpkin. <laughs> I just, again, saw it in Aldi. I mean, I'm a bit of a slag for a tiny pumpkin. I'm not going to lie. I absolutely love them. I think they're adorable. So I've got that. I'm going to pop it next to my play button. Yes, just a bit of a flex there that I have my play button in the back of my videos. So I've got that in my little pumpkin. Um, and I thought today what I was going to do is kick off the kind of spooky content, which is going to be coming over the next two, three weeks. And I thought I'd kick it off with um, giving you some recommendations, basically, for spooky content that you can read, that you can listen to on podcasts and that you can watch on the telly. If you've been around for a while, you'll know that I'm very interested in the paranormal. I don't necessarily know... Whether I'm a believer or not, I think I used to be. I used to be a believer and then I've been on quite a few ghost hunts and I've kind of started to become a little bit more of a sceptic. I would say I'm like a sceptical believer. I believe there's something in, in the afterlife. I don't believe that you just die and that's it, you're dead. I believe that something happens, the soul lives on, there's a connection to another world, but I just don't know what that is. And some ghost activity, some paranormal activity doesn't really make sense to me. So I'm, like I said, I would say that I'm a sceptical believer. And so I'm very interested in the paranormal. I watch a lot of paranormal shows. I listen to a lot of paranormal podcasts anyway. And then at this time of the year, it just becomes really lovely and spooky to try and like, um, watch more content and stuff. So I'm going to start this off with some book reviews. These I picked four books that I think are really good for kind of spooky content, uh, for reading around Halloween if you want a little bit of a scare um, and you want to read something that's going to really get you in that Halloween autumn kind of vibe. So the first one is The Daylight Gate by Jeanette Winterson. Now this book is absolutely fantastic. If you've read The Familiars by Stacey Halls, it is her book is about um, the witch hunts in Pendle, so the Pendle witch trials, and it's fantastic. However, I think that the Daylight Gate by Jeanette Winterson, it basically they both tell the same story but from two different perspectives. But Stacey Hall's The Familiars, which I've just got down off my bookshelf so that I can show it to you. I absolutely loved this book. I devoured it so fast. Um, and this is based at Gawthorpe Hall, and the character is Fleetwood Shuttleworth which is such a 17th century name, like Fleetwood Shuttleworth, just sounds like Jacobean, doesn't it? Um, and it's based at Gawthorpe Hall. Her husband, Richard, is anxious for an heir. And it's very much kind of, um, it is, it's very much a story about the Pendle Witches, but it's kind of seen through the perspective of this elite female character and how she engages with the local community and all of those key characters that we know of throughout the Pendle Witch Trial. So that is very good. But The Daylight Gate by Jeanette Winterson is just, it's written from the perspective of Alice Nutter, who's one of the main characters or main kind of historical figures within the Pendle Witch Trials. And she is, she's not part of the actual, what they believed was a coven of witches living together. She was kind of on the periphery, but she was very much um, a strong female character. She had her own, her own source of income. She was wealthy. She wasn't um, cowed or... She wasn't intimidated by male, that like kind of the males around her and the male influence in the area. She was very strong. She was very independent. She was very vocal. And when she sees things like other women being taken advantage of, she will stand up for them at the detriment of um, her reputation and at the detriment of um, her safety even at some point. So it's it's really, really interesting because it kind of, it draws you really into the, the kind of the middle of the Pendle Witch Trials. But Jeanette Winston's writing is just absolutely incredible. And I have on occasion found Jeanette Winston a little bit hard to read in terms of other things that she's written, um, just in terms of the language and the pace and that kind of thing. But The Daylight Gate was so beautifully written that it kind of, it, it wasn't hard to read at all. So I absolutely highly recommend it. If you want something that um, takes you into the heart of a real historical event that is around witchcraft and spooky things and 
makes you kind of question what you believe and what you don't believe, but ultimately talks about female agency and the female historical position and how vulnerable women were if men decided to turn against you during this period. Then The Daylight Gate by Jeanette Winkson and, to be honest, The Familiars by Stacey Halls are excellent books to read, so I really highly recommend them. The other book that I recommend is called Ash by James Herbert. Now, James Herbert, I think, is quite a niche author, so I think if you've never come across his work before, you wouldn't have heard of it. But he only writes paranormal narrative, so it's paranormal books, um, books about ghosts, and that his main character, Ash, is a um, paranormal investigator, he's a ghost hunter. And so all of his kind of like Ash books are all based around ghost hunting, going to the scene of paranormal activity and trying to work out what happens. I love his books for obvious reasons because I love ghosts and I love ghost hunting. But Ash itself is a really beautiful book because it's set in this massive old mansion and it's such an interesting storyline that it's not just your typical ghost narrative. So it's set at this huge kind of stately home manor house and he's brought along, he's invited to go there because there are rumours of paranormal ongoings. I believe that somebody may have died at the beginning of the book and so he's brought in to find out and discover what is happening. Now, I don't want to give too much away because the back of the book literally says about that and that's it. But suffice to say... It turns out that this massive manor house is a repository for very, very bad people who we all assume have died in real life. So people, if you can imagine any kind of like dictator, um, fraudster, this, that and the other, people like that who have been publicly killed or arrested or this, that and the other. It turns out that they're all at this manor house being kind of like housed in luxury but also kind of like being protected as well. I suppose it's like high class, very, very high class, very high expensive um, witness protection <laughs> in a way. And it really kind of like, it, it then starts to, he, Ash, the character, starts to try and find out what's happening with the paranormal activity whilst also trying to reconcile himself to the fact that he's surrounded by, you know, murderers and, and hugely kind of negative people. And what whether the paranormal activity may or may not be connected to the fact that these characters are all under one roof but the thing that i really loved about it so that in itself is such an original storyline that i was like that's it and i really enjoyed that aspect of it but also i think the thing that i loved about it was the way that the manor house was described the way that it kind of like all all of the events kind of happen in this one big manor house it kind of reminded me of the haunting with Liam Neeson and Catherine Zeta-Jones which is one of my all-time favorite like ghost paranormal horror films it's one of the films that actually really got me into country houses and into kind of stately home architecture and that's why I think when I was reading Ash it kind of reminded me of the house from The Haunting and it kind of played into that kind of stately home narrative. So I do love a good ghost story that, that crosses over with a stately home or a country house or a manor house because they're just such atmospheric places. There's so much history. So many of them are haunted. And so it's just the perfect setting, really. It's slightly isolated, slightly spooky. They're the perfect setting for a, a horror film or for a ghost narrative. So yeah, I can't tell any more about Ash because it's one of those that if I say too much, it'll just spoil it. But trust me, if you like something spooky, if you like a ghost story set in a country house, and if you like something that kind of plays with morality and plays with the concept of morality and life after death and what you do and don't deserve based on your actions in life, then Ash by James Herbert is the book for you. And the last book that I'm going to recommend is, surprise, surprise, it is a Laura Purcell book. <laughs> you all know, if you've watched any of my book recommendations, you know how much I absolutely love Laura Purcell as a writer. I think she's fantastic. And her very first book, The Silent Companions, is fantastic for reading during Halloween and during spooky season. So yeah, the story of The Silent Companions is based around a young woman called Elsie who is sent to her new husband's crumbling stately manor in the middle of nowhere. Laura Purcell's very great at not kind of giving a name to a location so you can kind of imagine it in your mind. But she's sent deep into the countryside into her husband's new home and she is 
isolated, she's away from her family, she's very young, she's very naive, she's very intimidated by her new husband, the servants who are in this house don't like her and it's about a young woman trying to find her place in a marriage when she is thrust into something that isn't really very familiar with her. I think from trying to remember the narrative I don't think that she comes from a lot of wealth so I think this kind of new position, new status is quite unfamiliar for her and so amongst her trying to kind of like find this position as the lady of the house and trying to kind of come to grips with her new status she starts to notice things not quite being a normal in her new house she starts to notice spooky things happening and one of the things that she starts to see is two silent companions and now silent companions are little um kind of cardboard wooden sometimes paper mache characters and they would be sat in front of a fire and what they would do is they would um they would guard the heat from the fire. So if you were sat in front of the fire on a night, you didn't want to get too warm, you didn't want to get too flushed, um, then you would put these little companions between you and the fire and it would mean that the room could still be warmed so that you were warm, but you weren't directly in front of the heat. And I used to, there were two that were at Lamport Hall when I worked there and I thought they were just called companions, um, but I'm guessing Laura Purcell's named them silent companions for her book. Um, and so, yeah, I'm familiar with them and they are creepy. They are, they're they like little people. And because they're stood upright, usually on a base, so you can move them around the room. They kind of look like children. Usually they are, because uh, they're all obviously quite short to be in the height of a fire. They're usually in the form of children that they're drawn. And so they are a little bit creepy. Um, if I've got any pictures of the ones at Lamport, I'll pop them on the screen now just so that you can see them. Um, and as Elsie is struggling with the house and with everything that's going on she starts to think that the companions are moving the little silent companions are moving around the house and so it's for me what i loved about it is that it was a combination of spooky and scary content but also it was that narrative around mental health and isolation and what um really being lonely and being isolated and being on your own in an unfamiliar place and can do to somebody's mental health and how it really kind of blurred the lines between what's paranormal activity and what is her interpreting things as paranormal activity as she is struggling with the decline of her mental health and I really like that it kind of reminded me a little bit of the yellow wallpaper um by Charlotte Perkins Gilman you know that I absolutely love that book as well yeah really really interesting I think Laura Purcell is the absolute queen of slowly ramping up the um creepiness factor and the tension and it's really good for kind of you get sucked into it so you get scared when these companions kind of show up you're like oh god oh no 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 that's creepy don't like that don't like that at all and the idea that you can be in a room and then you turn around and there's just this little hardboard child in the corner of the room just staring at you absolutely not <laughs> So yeah, if you want to be scared, that's definitely the book to read. So I hope that that gives you a really kind of like spectrum of books to be able to read depending on your tastes. Let me know what your favourite go-to spooky book is around this time of year. And if I haven't read it, maybe I'll add it to my TBR list. So those are the books. Next, I'm going to move on to podcasts. So I've got two podcasts that I want to recommend to you. The first one is actually become gone from a podcast to a live show to a TV show. So that's a bit of an unusual one. And you may already be aware of it, but it's called Uncanny. And there's a guy called Danny Robbins who runs the podcast. And he is the writer of 222, the stage show, which I think has been around for quite a while. It's been around for a good few years now. My friend Becca went to see it. And um, it's a ghost story, basically, that plays out on the stage. And I suspect, I, I haven't seen it, but I suspect it's about, you know, paranormal activity happening at 222 trying to find out who's behind it so he wrote that and then he's written a series of podcasts really called uh, I think one was called unknown one was called paranormal um but uncanny seems to be where he's absolutely hit the jackpot in terms of taking people's paranormal experiences and making it into a podcast so Danny is the host he's the narrator but he interviews real people who have had paranormal experiences and the very first episode of series one is called Bloody Hell Ken. <laughs> and the reason it's called that is because halfway through, this guy called Ken is telling his paranormal story. And Danny just goes, oh, bloody hell, Ken. 
<laughs> and it became like an iconic line that everybody was saying. And to be honest, I was really late to this game. I only came across Uncanny in, when was it? Was it April this year? I think when I found it. So, I mean, it, it's on like four seasons. It's on season four now in terms of podcast seasons. So I think it's been out for a couple of years. Um, but I found it on um, the app store, or on the podcast store, when I was looking on holiday for something to listen to. And I just binged it. It's absolutely brilliantly done. It's very balanced. So it's Danny interviewing this person, but then Danny Robbins brings in experts. So if you've watched Most Haunted, you will recognise the name Kieran O'Keefe. So he's one of the experts that talks about it. He obviously comes from a paranormal, um, uh, sorry, from a sceptical perspective. And then Danny also gets on paranormal experts who are believers and they talk about why they think it could be real paranormal activity. And so it's a really lovely kind of, they're usually about kind of 30, 40 minute long episodes, but you get a spooky narrative. Then you get these experts coming in and chiming in on whether they think it's true, whether it's, um, you know, not fake because Kieran O'Keefe believes that, that person is experiencing what they're experiencing, but he says why it might not be paranormal, why it can be re-rational, rationed away, rationed away, rationalised. Um, and it's just fantastic. And like I say, we're on season four now. I think we've had two episodes of season four. And then it's now on stage. So Danny Robbins is doing a, a touring stage show with it at the moment, as I record this. Sadly, I can't go to any of the dates. Got too much on and it's not actually coming too close to Huddersfield so I can't go and see it on stage but I've heard that it's very very good and then also something that's just come out recently is the TV show now I haven't watched any of the episodes of the TV show I might watch one tonight actually but I think it's the same type of thing I think some cases that we've heard of in the podcast and some brand new cases that we've not heard of in the podcast yet and it's kind of like a tv version it's a tv investigation I'm assuming he will go and interview people who've had experiences he'll bring on some experts and they may try and get to the bottom of what caused it maybe try and get some paranormal activity caught on camera who knows so honestly if you're wanting something to watch maybe on Halloween or in the run-up to Halloween, maybe something you can listen to while you're making dinner, while you're out walking, or while you're on your commute to up to and from work, something to just kind of get you into the, the mood. I highly, highly, highly recommend Uncanny. Like, I can't recommend it enough. It is absolutely brilliant, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the TV show. So the next podcast I'm going to recommend, I actually can't find the name of the lady who hosts it, and I'm sure she has told her said her name before because um I can almost hear it in my mind um but I follow her on TikTok and Instagram and I also listen to her podcast but I'm really sorry I can't think of her name but the podcast is called Real Life Ghost Stories and again it's very similar to Uncanny in that it is real people's ghost experiences and the host she will read out these stories that have been sent in by listeners and then she reacts to them so it's a little bit different from Uncanny in that Uncanny is a BBC Sounds podcast. It's got a lot of production to it. Um, you can you can hear that there's been like a lot of money thrown behind it. Whereas Real Life um, Ghost Stories is a person created podcast. So this host, she creates it all herself. She records it, edits, puts it up. And I think the thing that I love about this one is that she's constantly creating content. Where you get content series as through BBC Sounds like Uncanny, you get 10 episodes and then you've got to wait like eight, nine months for another 10 episodes. With something like Real Life Ghost Stories, you're getting content every single week. And that's what I love because for me, I listen to podcasts all the time. So I want something that every single week there is a new episode for me to listen to. And that's why I love real life ghost stories. But I love it because it's a little bit more informal and I just love her reactions to the content. So she'll be reading out a story and then all of a sudden she'll be like, no, absolutely not. I would know part of that situation so fast, <laughs> which is what I love. You get a little bit more... Um, humour, a little bit more kind of real reactions. It's less scripted. Um, I mean, I don't think Uncanny is necessarily fully scripted, but it feels very paced and kind of um, thought out in terms of its format. Whereas this is, and I'm not trying to say it's not well thought out, is in um, real life ghost stories because it is. She, she has a very good format, um, but it's a little bit more organic. It's a little bit more real. And I like that. I really love the kind of warmth and the humour and 
um, just the live kind of reaction to the stories, um, I think they're absolutely brilliant. So yeah, very, very good. Um, the host is also doing something called 31 Days of Terror this month, which is where you actually get ghost stories every single day throughout October. So that's like bumper content. And they're shorter episodes, so they're like 12, 15 minutes long but you get lots more content. So I've been really enjoying kind of diving into her podcast at the moment and reading it uh, and listening to it. So that's real life ghost stories, highly recommend. So moving on to TV shows, and I've already mentioned one, which is Uncanny. The second TV show that I really want to recommend is on YouTube and it is a channel called Amy's Crypt. And Amy is a Australian ghost hunter and she and her husband, Jared, go all over the world filming in paranormal locations. So she does ghost, ghost hunts, a little bit like Ghost Adventures, Most Haunted, um, any of those kind of shows, but they are purely YouTube Patreon based. Yeah, so she is, they are purely on YouTube. Um, they're not on television yet, although I won't be surprised if they don't get, try to get picked up by a network at some point, because their paranormal investigations are just really, really well thought out. They're really well structured. They're sympathetic, they're understanding, they're respectful of the locations that they go into, they're respectful of the spirits that may or may not be there. Um, and they're not focused on drama, on screaming, on, oh, it's a demon, you know, it, it's very much the going and they want to speak to any spirits that might be there. They're respectful and they're also very upfront when things don't happen, when they don't have a very active night. Um, and that's what I like. I used to watch a lot of Twin Paranormal who are also on YouTube and they were great when they first started out. The same, very respectful, very kind of, um, you know, coming into a location and, and listening to see what happened. And to be honest, unfortunately, over the last kind of 12 months, they've just kind of gone the other way. They're just like, all they do is look at demons and everything's like, oh, demon attacked us. And it's, it's a bit too... Um, overly dramatic now for my liking. I like the kind of quiet going in, letting the spirit speak for themselves and actually genuinely trying to get proper paranormal um, kind of footage on camera. And I'm not saying that Twin Paranormal aren't trying to do that. Um, it's just different. It's different kind of uh, entertainment of different people, I suppose. Some people will love that kind of more dramatic style. It's why things like Ghost Adventures are still doing incredibly well because they've gone down that slightly more dramatic um, negative paranormal experience route whereas I really like the ones that go for the more positive paranormal experience stories so Most Haunted although uh, we can't really say that Most Haunted is actually genuinely trying to find paranormal phenomena but I like it for the entertainment factor but Amy's Crypt is genuinely trying to capture paranormal stuff and they've also created their own kind of ghost detection apps so they have something called Ghost Tube which allows people to come and talk and um, kind of to manipulate the e the electronic kind of flow within the phone, I think. I'm not entirely sure of the technology. Um, and so they can speak. There's paranormal, I think they've got um, YouTube Seer. No, not YouTube, what's it called? Ghost Tube Seer, which it uses um, goggles and AI technology. Really, really clever. Very clever couple in terms of being able to develop that technology. And they use that within their episodes as well. And actually it was one of, um, my followers who actually got me onto Amy's Crypt, I think maybe last Halloween. So they'd said, they'd looked at my um, videos about kind of paranormal stuff and said, oh, I really love Amy's Crypt. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll go on and have a look at an episode and absolutely loved it. So I'm hooked now. So that's why I'm recommending it. So thank you to that person who recommended Amy's Crypt to me. I absolutely love them. Amy and Jared are so brilliant together as a couple um, and they just, they, they really play off each other really well. Um, I am going on my own ghost hunt at the end of this month and Tom is going to be coming with me. Um, so I was going to go with my cousin, but unfortunately for personal reasons, she can't come with me. And she's the person that I usually go on ghost hunts with because she's very much into the paranormal as well. But she can't come this time. So me and Tom are going to go together. Now, Tom is a hardcore sceptic, does not believe in ghosts at all, believes that when you die, you die. That's it. 
and he rolls his eyes when I talk about ghosts. But I've got two, t two spaces booked for this paranormal investigation. And I think it'd be really interesting to bring Tom along to see what his perspective is. The organisers have agreed to let me and Tom go off and do a solo vigil on our own and to record it for YouTube. So it's going to be a bit of a vlog and then there'll be that solo vigil of me and Tom. So that'll be coming up. I'm going to try, like I say, we're going on the 27th. I'm going to try and get it... Um, released early on in the day on the 31st so that you can actually watch it on Halloween. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, definitely check out Amy's Crypt on YouTube for some really, really high quality uh, paranormal investigations. And the last thing, the very, very last show that I'm going to tell you to watch if you're interested in spooky content is an old BBC show called The Living and the Dead. Now, I believe you can only get this on Amazon now. I had a look everywhere to see if I could find it anywhere else and I can't find it anywhere other than Amazon. So maybe have a look around. It might be different depending on what country you're in. But it is a show about a physician and his wife who moved to like Plymouth, Devon, Cornwall way in England in the early 1900s. I think it's, yeah, it's either the late 1800s or early 1900s. And they basically, he inherits um, a stately home and they have been very much kind of city couple living in the city in London. And then they move out to the country and they decide they're going to become kind of like estate owners, estate managers. They're going to get the farm running and he's going to practice. I think he's a psychiatrist or a psychologist and he's going to practice from the house as well as managing the estate. And together him and his wife and they've got a little, I think they've got a child or they're trying to have a child. No, I think they've got a baby and um, they are living in this house and they've got some servants, this, that and the other. And it's kind of their story, but it's all very slightly thrillerish, slightly paranormal. So from the moment they get there, spooky things start happening in the house. There's paranormal activity, um, but also weird things happen in the village. There's like girls that get possessed there's people who die there's there's lots of kind of very strange things that happen in the village itself and so whilst they're trying to work out what's happening in the house in terms of paranormal activity they're also trying to work out what weird stuff is going on in the village and this that, and the other it's a really beautifully presented kind of atmospheric period drama that has spooky content as well it kind of hits everything for me it's period drama i love it it's kind of set in a wild rugged landscape with lots of kind of knit natural scenes and beautiful shots that i love it's got unusual kind of psychological things going on and, and mysteries that need to be solved it and it's got ghosts and it's got paranormal stuff and i don't want to reveal the twist because it was a bit of a twist but it's got um a really really interesting concept about what the paranormal may be and what represents the paranormal so i definitely recommend it i think you do have to purchase it on amazon so i totally understand if if people can't do that at this time but i'm going to be re-watching it before halloween because it's just one of those period dramas that i just love and i think about it a lot i'm always like oh, i could really re-watch living in the dead um so yeah highly recommend it so that's it. Those are my spooky recommendations for the season. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Like I say, it's just a bit of something to give you some spooky content as we go into the second half of October and as we head towards Halloween. And I'm going to be back with more spooky content. I'm going to be reading you. I'm going to do a little video, which is basically reading some ghost stories from this book, Glimpses of the Unknown. And it's Lost Ghost Stories from the British Library and I've read a couple of them and they are quite spooky but they're quite short as well so I thought that one of the videos I would do would be to read a couple of these stories just to really get you into the spooky mood and then I've got a vegetable carving video so it's not going to be a pumpkin but we are going to carve something else for Halloween then of course there's the ghost hunt so there's plenty of things coming up plenty of spooky content coming up so yes if all of that sounds great if you're enjoying spooky season if you want to kind of hear more from me i produce videos on books literature period dramas um what else do i do i'm a writer <laughs> always forget to say that it's always like it's books period drama I am a published writer of non-fiction. I'm currently writing my first fiction novel and I share kind of videos and updates on how I'm writing, my writing tips, how I got published, all that kind of stuff. So if you are an aspiring writer or you are a writer and you want some 
focus videos, you want some tips, you want to discuss what it's like to be a writer, the kind of behind the scenes reality of being a writer, or if you're a book lover, period drama lover, and you love that content too, then please do consider subscribing. Um, and yeah, I will be back very shortly with another video. Okay, thanks guys. See you soon. Bye.